Hey, our City Church, welcome. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Pastor Chris. I lead pastor here at our City Church. If this is your first time, I wanna welcome you and say thank you for being here. Uh, it's an honor to have you. Today we're gonna be opening up a series of talks and discussions about our emotions and how they play such a big role in the everyday experience that you have with people you love, people you don't know, uh, people you work with, people you work underneath, people you work um, in leadership above. And I hope today is gonna begin a open discussion about maybe things that have stayed invisible to you. Maybe they were invisible in your family or invisible in your life and uh, you're just starting to wake up to how important the way your emotions are. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to look into this story of some questions that Jesus got, and they were asking him a bunch of different things, and, and we're going to get there in a minute. The reason I want to really open up the idea about emotions um, really has to do with how a lot of us see the American dream, which is this. The American dream for so many of us, if, if you were honest, Nobody really wants to be told what to do, right? Like if you're a parent, you've seen how easy it is to see in children, they don't want to be told what to do. We discover this really early, right, around kids. The American dream really is to get to the place where you have the, uh, the ability to say, no one can tell me what to do anymore, right? We call this uh, with a word, autonomy. Autonomy is being able to do what I want, when I want to do it. And we are convinced that if we could call our own shots, that once I'm able to call my own shots, that is when I'm going to just have the best life ever. And the idea that for us, that you know, autonomy is what we're all seeking, is, is wrapped into what we're all working so hard for, what we study for, is in the end, I want to go where I want to go. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be able to have what I want to have. And I don't want anyone else to tell me, no, I don't want anyone else to tell me what I can't do. This autonomy is a part of our experience, especially and mostly even here in America. And, and the reality is though, is that so often we get into trouble because this idea of no one ever telling you what to do and you just basically being um, alone to decide what is your right, what is your wrong, uh, is, is fine. But the truth of the matter is that whether you think so or not, you may get to the place one day financially where no one is the boss, of your life, but the reality is, is we get into trouble because we all have another boss. And I'm not even talking about God. I'm talking about within us. We all have something else working and they end up telling us what to do. They dictate how we respond. They dictate, and it's our emotions. And we don't get in trouble. Listen, we don't get in trouble because we're not willing to take advice. We actually get into trouble because we we take our own advice. Something is going on inside of us. It gets filtered through our emotions and it gives us a distorted picture of reality. And, and that's why this, uh, this, this new series of talks, the subtitle is How to Say No to the Emotions that Compete for Control. Why don't you write that down in the chat, type it in there. How to Say No to the Emotions that Compete for Control. Uh, of course, emotions are a gift from God. We love emotions. Emotions are how you experience joy and love and romance and laughter and, and fulfillment and purpose. Emotions are a key part. But the reality is, is that emotions also have a, a dark side. They have a bad side. They have a side that can be uh, really bossy. They could be bullies. They could take over. And what I want to do is begin a series of discussions on a, a number of different emotions that left unchecked can absolutely take over, control our lives, and become our boss. And I don't want you to miss out on having autonomy in your life, I don't want you to miss out on being the boss of your own emotions. And we have to all monitor our behavior to stay out of trouble. So you can get an interview, so you can get an invitation to something, so you can get a job, you can meet someone, you can get a date, right? But Jesus invites his followers to go much further than just getting that through behavior modifications, looking like you're okay, looking like you're controlling your behavior isn't the same as really being in charge of your emotions. And thanks to the insight that Jesus has that we're going to look into today, it's easier to identify the bad advice that comes from within us. The bad advice that not comes from someone telling you, you should this and you do it and then it's like, oh, that was terrible. No, the bad advice that actually lurks underneath uh, our heart, inside our heart. And, and I want you to hear a little bit about what was going on. In Matthew 15, we're going to read into some of, of what it says. And, and it's really a powerful part of what happens. Everybody say there and then. Uh, if you're new around here, 
Every week I preach from this perspective, we call it there and then. I want you to know what's happening there and then in the story of the Bible before we talk about the here and now. And so here's what's going on. Jesus is going to be approached by some masters of what we would call the Old Testament law. And what happens here is that they come and they want to challenge him. They have a problem. We don't know what the problem is, but let's go ahead and read into it and see kind of what it is that they're trying to point out or prove or catch him doing wrong. That's their big goal. They're the religious leaders of their day, and they've definitely disconnected what it means to actually know and follow God from know and follow the rules. They care more about people having a relationship with the rules than having a relationship with God, and Jesus comes as God. God and says, you guys have gotten off. You're a little off where I wanted this to go. This is not how we intended it to go. I, I want rules. Rules are good for you. And I put them out there. But, but the point of them is to connect relationship, not for the relationship to take over being with the rules versus being with God. So let's lean into this. Chapter 15, verse 1, this is how Jesus uh, interacts with them. It says, then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem. This is really key if you're in your Bible circle. They came from Jerusalem. That means they left their offices. They left to go meet with him. When you leave your home and you go to meet with someone, you leave your office, this is suggesting and pointing out there's something significant you have to do. They want to meet with him. Now, keeps going. It says, they asked him, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Underline that, the tradition of the elders. We'll get into that in a second. They don't, ready? They don't wash their hands before they eat which is kind of like, ew, gross. Now, here's what the tradition of the elders was. They had the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. That was the written law. This was very big to them. It was how they knew God and they honored God was to follow the law of God, that God's law was from his heart and it was perfect. And it was the way that we would live in right relationship with God. And it was also the way we would live in right relationship with each other, that God in the goodness of his heart wanted to make sure that all mankind uh, was able to function in relationship with him and it was the best way to live the best things to eat the best way to treat others how to handle things in court all the stuff that had to do with cultivating your life was in this law however what ended up happening is that they had this tradition of the elders this was a different list that was only it was never written down it was the oral tradition and only a few religious leaders actually had access to it and what they began to do was hold this as kind of like this secret code that only they knew because it wasn't written down and so no one could check and balance it. And they would say, no, 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 no. Yeah, you might be doing that stuff, but you're not doing this stuff right. And if you don't do this stuff, you're offending the tradition of the elders. And they were then able to judge you, look down at you, make you feel like you're worse and you're bad and God's really not even like connected to you. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he doesn't buy it. He's like, no, 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 that, that whole thing that you guys are doing is keeping people from God. It's supposed to invite and inspire and move people towards God, not make them say, I'm never going back to church, man. I don't ever want to read a Bible. I don't want to know about Jesus. I don't want to know anything. And so many of you know exactly what that's like. You got turned off the same way. You got turned off and you got hurt or you got just disenfranchised because that's what you saw. This is exactly what Jesus actually comes to resist and to get rid of. He's like, I want to get rid of that kind of religious way of doing it. I do want you to know God. And there are rules of how to know God. And there are things that I want to say you shouldn't do because everything can't be okay to do because that would mean there's like no no desire that you can't have and God's like no 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 that's not how I created it that's not how I made it however I'm not here to, to do it through a religious system now they were created again to keep some of these 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 other people feeling like they weren't doing what's right so um, they, they come and they ask why do you break the command of God Jesus replied sorry verse 3 it says Jesus replied now why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? So Jesus kind of calls out their hypocrisy. He, he calls out their tradition and he says, you know what you're doing? You're using this to actually bypass responsibility to your parents. You are doing different things to try to get out and under. You're literally using your secret connection and this other unwritten stuff to just judge and look at people uh, like they're less than you. 
And then verse 6, he says, thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. And then he goes and quotes the Old Testament um, prophet Isaiah, and he says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah, he's using it to transition to a powerful insight. And this is a very key idea. It's very important for us to lean in because there's a difference, again, between behavior modification, looking like you're doing it right, and what really matters to God, because he is not about just appearing like it's going well, appearing like you're connected, appearing like, you know, these religious leaders are like, well, we look like we're doing it right. He goes, no, you know what? Isaiah said something about you hundreds of years ago, and I want you to hear it. And he says this, verse eight, these people honor me with their lips. Basically, they've learned to say all the right things. He continues, but their hearts are far from me. They've turned religion into a game that they could always win. Who's in, who's out, who's right, who's wrong. And then we get to hate who's wrong that don't line up with us. Religious leaders and religious believers, even in God, even in our day, tend to do the same thing. And see, a crowd begins to gather. So Jesus drops a bombshell idea and then just kind of like walks away. Watch verse 10. He goes on and he says, listen and understand. And any teacher, any parent, any husband, wife, if you've ever been in a relationship with, you know, emotions that are highly involved, you understand there's a difference between someone listening to you and understanding you. They might be listening, but they're just listening long enough to hear what they want to say back to you. They're listening and waiting for you to take a breath so that they could argue back their point. But Jesus is like, look, listen and understand. What would happen if you took those words just type that in. Somebody need to write that down. I need to learn how to listen and understand. In fact, listen to understand is what he really means by that. Listen to understand. Don't just listen to argue. And then he says this, verse 11. What goes into someone's mouth, and he's actually talking about like on accident, right? Like, because that's what they were all upset at. Like, wait, you're not washing your hands, and if something is wrong that you accidentally eat, it could defile you. Like, if you accidentally have like a little bit of this or a little bit or, or a seasoning you're not allowed to have, some deal, it would defile them. And he says this, he says, listen, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. This was massive. He's basically saying God is not small. God is not petty. He's not some gotcha God. You didn't know that was in there, but now you're defiled. Now you're bad, and now I'm going to judge you. You get put in a penalty box of life for an accidental breach in etiquette. No, he, he continues. He goes, but what comes out of their mouth, now that's what defiles them. And it's kind of like Jesus just turns and drops the mic and walks away. And the disciples follow, and, and they, they look back probably at the Pharisees thinking like, Ha ha! You know, like, take that, but we really don't know what you meant either, Jesus, right? So they're walking away, and then verse 12 tells us kind of this follow-up discussion Jesus has with his closest disciples. So the Pharisees are kind of, like, kicking the curb. There were no curbs. They're kicking dust, kicking rocks. They go, ha ha! Kick rocks. So they're kicking rocks, dude, and they're just rolling out. The disciples are like, yeah, how you like that one, Jesus? Or um, Pharisees, Jesus got you on that. But then they roll up on Jesus. They're like, hey, Jesus, um, do you know that you offended the Pharisees when you said that? They came to him and asked, did, did you know that they were kind of offended when they heard what you said? Verse 14, Jesus says, I want you to leave them their blind guides. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a pit. The problem was that it sounded like Jesus was dissing their law, but he wasn't. But they needed some reassuring. And so Peter speaks up and asks kind of the collective question everyone's wondering. Um, Look, this kind of sounds like you're clowning the law that we follow, and I, I'm sure you're not, but can you clarify this a little bit? And he asks, Lord, would you explain the parable to us? Would you just tell us what it means? Okay, and Jesus, I think, um, you know, in this, th th there's a little more relationship. It's hard to hear humor or um, sarcasm or a fun-loving spirit in a discussion, but he's like, he says in verse 16, do, are you guys still so dull? Do you still not get this thing? Like how, how much do I have to make this plain, okay? And every one of us who've ever tried to teach anyone time and time again something, they still don't get it, okay? But he does stop to explain. Now, the next part of this conversation, we catch a glimpse of what Jesus and God, the Heavenly Father, value most and what we should value most. And spoiler alert, God is not most concerned with how our behavior affects him. Did you hear that? 
Because that's so much what fear is, is, is told uh, in religious systems, is it's all about your behavior is affecting me. If you're part of a religious system designed around traditions that supposedly keep you in good standing with God, because you need to do all these things, and if you don't do them, you're not in good standing with God, you're not a good, whatever, Christian, Catholic, whatever the whole thing is, you should run away as fast as you can. Because when Jesus says, are you still so dull? He is basically going to now introduce, you want to know what can defile you? You want to know where the defiling comes from? This was such a powerful understanding for them because defiling puts you at odds with God. You, you were disconnected. There was something off between you and your relationship with God. Do you understand what that means? You ever have a, something go down between your, 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 your siblings and there's, just, there's this off thing for a day, a week, a month, a year? And you just have, it's just like, it's off right? And you're like, man, that, that off thing, it's not connection. It's not what God designed. God designed humility or forgiveness or listen to understand as resources and tools emotionally for us to be able to actually access healthy connection. And so when that stuff's not there, it's like, whoa, this isn't, this isn't what I want. Like, I, I don't want you to have odd with each other. And he says this, you could be at odds with me. I could be at odds with you. But it's not based on some list of stuff that if you don't get these traditions done, these traditions you had better do. And if you don't do them, then you are at odds with me. You have affected me. No. The reality is, is this is not what God is most concerned with. God is not most concerned with behavior that affects him, he is most concerned with behaviors that affect you and me, others. That's where God zooms in. And you're about to see the heart of Jesus and the heart of God of what it is that he wants you to say. He says this in verse 17. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth, ready, goes into the stomach, mouth into the stomach, and then out of the body. And I'm sure the disciples are kind of like crossing their hands like, well, we're not that dull, Okay. Yeah, we get that. We see that a few times a day, okay? Jesus' point is, look, if something goes off limits, right? Like if something off limits, rather, sorry, if it goes into your body and it moves right through your system, right? Like it's no harm done to anyone, even though they had this religious system that said, you'd better not let anything sneak into there. They literally had this religious way when they would drink uh, from a cup, wine or anything, water or whatever. They had this super, these religious people had this super like, um, um, elaborate kind of way to drink it. They would have, they wanted to make sure no fly or gnat ever touched it unknowingly to you because if you drank it after someone else or you didn't know and there was a gnat in there, you were unclean and had to go through all these ceremonial washings because you didn't know and after all, your behavior affects God and God's now mad at you, so you are defiled. And, and so they literally had this like lid that you had to lift up, press down with your thumb, it would lift it up, you take a drink and put it back down and the lid came down, but the lid had like a linen cloth on top of it that like was sealed over and, 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 and kind of connected. So you would lift, drink, do, it, it was all for religious reasons. It wasn't even for health. It was just like, yeah, you better make sure you don't accidentally put something in your mouth that goes into your body because you'll be defiled and God is going to be affected by your bad behavior. He's like, no, it, it, don't, don't you see that? It just goes in your mouth, goes in your stomach and comes out your body. And they're like, okay, we, we understand that. No harm done. Now watch, here you go. Verse 18, he tells us what it is. He goes, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, the things that come out of your mouth, my mouth, this is wholly different. He goes, this, this is what these things defile them. Again, defiled is to be at odds with God. It's not washing your hands that does that. Jesus says it's way deeper than that. What comes out of your mouth can put us at odds with people, which puts us at odds with God. See, the main point wasn't to make sure you didn't accidentally get some juice or wine or water or some drink or some piece of food that had a gnat that landed on it. And then you unknowingly put it in your body and now your whole connection with God is defiled. He's like, no, that's, that's not his main point. Here's his main point, verse 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from the heart. They originate from within. And he says, and these defile them. So the source of your defiling is offensive words and deeds, but it's because it's in you. That's what he says. It comes from in you. And you might push back and say, look, not everything I say, you know, comes from my heart. Sometimes I'm just 
skipping around. You know, I'm, I'm just saying stuff. I'm just like messing around. I'm just like kind of like, ah, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just playing around. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean it. And Jesus would, pet, he would push back on that. He would say, well, sometimes you say things you, you don't mean, but that's what you would say. He would say, sometimes you say things that you don't mean to say out loud. In essence, uh, your heart is showing when you say those things. Because he continues and he lets you know, look, the reason it came out of you is because it's in you. That stuff's in your heart. And he continues, verse 19, he says, for out of the heart, watch this, come evil thoughts. So thoughts of, here's the thoughts that come out. Thoughts of murder. He says murder starts as a thought and you have these thoughts of it. Adultery, um, immorality. Theft comes from the heart, thoughts come from your thoughts and, and your heart, false testimony, lying, slander, speaking negatively about somebody else. And Mark, he adds in Mark chapter 7, 22, he adds something else that Matthew didn't write that Mark was listening. And he says that Jesus added greed. Okay, greed comes from your heart. Malice comes from your heart. Deceit comes from your heart. These thoughts, these, these evil thoughts all come out of the heart. And he, and he says envy comes from the heart, arrogance, and folly. And folly, I love, folly is one of my favorite ones out of that whole list because it's such a word no one ever uses. But let me tell you, write this down. Folly is simply this. Folly equals bad judgment. Bad judgment. Unwise decisions, okay? Um, relationship killing decisions, career killing decisions, financially de um, debilitating things all start in our heart, all of these things. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus continues, he says, look, these are what defile a person. This is what defiles a person. These are what puts you at odds with God. It's because they put you at odds with others, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. See, real uh, religious rituals and traditions, they are often very helpful for us. If you were at our birthday last week, we took communion in person. It was very powerful. It was special. I believe in the traditions that connect us to God and to each other. That's what they're meant for. But when they become a source of actually keeping people away from God, pushing certain people down, being things that my tradition of how I see God and what I think actually allows me to judge people who don't do it as good as me. You don't have the same passion. You don't read your Bible as much as me. You, you do this too much and I don't do those things. He's like, whoa, religious rituals and rules and traditions and law are supposed to be inspiring and helpful to us to connect to God and to connect to others, not the opposite. And, and he says, look, they are often helpful to us, but they often, they, they give us credit instead of giving God credit. So we get credit for doing all the right things. And he says, look, how you treat others is really what makes Jesus smile. So missing mass or communion or your quiet time or your time with the Bible or Jesus, or, or those aren't the things that defile you. It's if you mistreat someone God loves. Well, now that's a whole other thing. What comes out of us is what defiles us. So what we're going to do for the next couple weeks is we're going to... I don't know, we're going to start or come back to, or maybe for many of you, never have done it before. We're going to begin to practice monitoring what is going on inside of us so it doesn't come out of us. We're going to personalize and name these things that lurk within us. We're going to call them out and let them know, listen, you are not the boss of me. I want you to say that, type that, say it out loud while you type that. Say that. You are not the boss of me. You, you are not the boss of me. And you can maybe even say, anger, you are not the boss of me. Envy, you are not the boss of me. Greed, you are not the boss of me. Lust, you are not the boss of me. Insecurity, you are not the boss of me. Fear, you are not the boss of me. For the next few weeks, we're going to look honestly about these emotions that take over our decision making, they take over our rational thought, they take over our wisdom, they take over our judgment, and we end up coming with folly and messing up our lives, and they become the boss. Instead of what we think is best, what we know is best, what we want to be, we just become led by the tyrants of our hurt or broken or damaged or unhelpful emotions. And, and be honest, how different would your life be if you, they weren't the boss? Or, or how about this, how different would your life have been 
if your dad's anger hadn't been the boss of him? What if your mom's fear hadn't have been the boss of her? Let's be honest about that. What if the people around you, what if the issues that they have, what if when you grew up, like that one coach, that one teacher, or that one person that really hurt your heart, what if their emotions that were broken weren't the boss of them? See, this is why it's important. Whether you believe in Jesus or follow the Bible or not, you're just watching this, I wanna tell you, here's the reality. This is why it's so important. The people closest to you right now, they are all experiencing the overflow of your heart right now, every single day. This is already happening. And without us being honest, without these things going from the invisible to the visible, and we see it and we're honest and we're reflecting upon it, this isn't something that we can ever, ever overcome. And they stay the boss. And if you're a Christian or a Jesus follower, as, as, as we like to say, then this is crucial because we have a better boss than anger. We have a better boss than lust. We have a better boss than greed. We have a better boss than fear. We have a better boss than envy. We have a better boss than insecurity. And here's the invitation. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus invites us to something different. He's a better boss. He says this, come to me, all of you who are weary, you're tired of being under the thumb and the constant tyranny of these bosses. And many, many, for some of you, it's different, multiple bosses. And you're tired and you're weary. And he says, and I will give you rest. He says, follow me. Let me be the boss of you. Let my ways become your ways. I'll do something for you because I don't need anything from you. Did you hear that? Jesus wants to do something for you because he doesn't need anything from you. He introduces this other idea. He continues in verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Take my ideas, my ways, and learn from me for I am gentle and I am humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. How many of you just that one promise you need right now? You need rest for your soul. You need rest for your mind. You need rest from these bosses that have been just awful to you and they've bossed you around your whole life. And then you look back at all the fractured relationships and fractured memories and fractured vacations and fractured birthday parties and fractured whatever it is. And you just say, gosh, man, I just don't want those things. You're not the boss of me anymore. Listen, Jesus says, follow me. And maybe your need for someone to always have to boss you around and tell you how to do it, those things can go away once and for all. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I come before you and I know and believe in your power. I know and believe, God, that you want to be the boss of us, not to thumb us down, not to boss us around and make us do these things, but because of an everlasting love that was demonstrated in Jesus coming to earth and giving himself for us, God, and, and, and being a person that shows us the love of the Father. And Jesus, we hear your words today, and, and, and they're, they're challenging and convicting in a helpful way. They cleanse the broken and hurt and, and, and messed up parts of my heart and our heart. And I pray today that you would help us over the next many weeks as we walk through these discussions of the different bosses, the things that take over those moments and make us act out ways that violate what is best for for us and best for the ones we love. Would you help change that? Help us to become aware of it and help us become honest about it. And God, let us lean into you. You said, come to me. I pray that we would all start there, that we would come to you knowing you do not reject, you do not deny, you do not judge. You open your arms and you welcome us closely and say, I love you with an everlasting love and I am here to help you change who's the boss of you. Who's the boss? It's no longer these broken emotions. I want to become the leader of your life. God, be the Lord of us so God, we can enjoy the life you created us to have. I ask this over our city church and all of our friends around the nation, all of our friends around the world, and I bless them now in the true meaning of the word, the blessing in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen.
Amen. Hey, can't wait for next week. It's going to be an incredible time, uh, I think, over the next many weeks. Please invite a couple people to come listen to this. Would you share this today? Don't do it tomorrow. Share it today as soon as you can with some people. You can copy text it. You can do it to your social media. And uh, that will help us really, our heart at Our City Churches, we want to help people find God and experience life in Christ and life like they've never had it before. And lastly, thank you to all of you who continually support our ministry. If you would like to begin to support Our City Church, you can do that at ourcity.church slash give, and you can help us get this to people all around the world. We can't do it without you, and we love you and bless you for that. You guys have a great weekend. We love you so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for that amazing message. We are so excited for the rest of this series of talks. And thank you to everybody who tuned in with us today, especially those of you who are watching together at watch parties. We love that you tuned in today. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, go ahead, take a moment and subscribe and also turn on the notifications so you can see when we're going live or posting new content. And if you like today's message, would you take just a moment and would you go ahead and hit that like button or even share it with a couple friends that you know could use this encouragement in their lives today. And our city, I want you to know this right here, this is how we change the world together. We'll see you next week.